Warning, we got y'all profanity for Christmas. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Honey, Keeps, and by Ballistic Mistletoe, the brand new holiday tradition of throwing mistletoe the fuck away. Ballistic Mistletoe, because the entire custom is weird and rapey. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Hi, this is John Carter. I don't host a podcast. I don't have a book to sell. I didn't finish a degree in anything, and if I'm the smartest guy in the room, I'm probably in a porta potty But I can still tell you that we did, in fact, evolve from filthy monkey men and women. Because you don't have to be smart to not be stupid. It's December 17th. And it's National Maple Syrup Day. Finally! Let's just cut out the middleman and do some shots, right? (laughs) No illusions. Shots, shots, shots. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. I was just doing a shot. And from (laughs) Artie Lang's New Jersey, Cincinnati Red State, and Redtown Blue State, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, we'll introduce you to a Christmas song you didn't know you hate yet. Consensual cannibalism is actually trending on Twitter, whatever the fuck that means. And Kurt Cameron will once again chicken out on my annual candy cane knife fight challenge. <laughs> but first, the diatribe. Coward, right? You know, sometimes you have a conversation that starts with you trying to make a charitable donation and ends with you threatening to ejaculate all over somebody's holy book. No, it's just me. See, some weeks I write the diatribes and some weeks the diatribes just write their own damn selves. And this week is more of the latter type. In fact, if I'd thought to record the fucking call, I probably could have called it an interview and gotten a solid 20 minutes of material out of it. So let me set the uh, stage for you here. I've actually had a pretty good year this year financially, right? I mean, obviously, podcast donations are down given the economic circumstances and we didn't have live show revenue this year. But like, I didn't spend any fucking money this year. I haven't taken any trips. I haven't gone out to eat. I haven't gone to the movies or the mall or a game. I've literally left my yard seven times since March. On top of that, Lucinda and I also saved the 4000 bucks a year that we would have otherwise spent being smokers. Now, of course, at the same time, I know that a lot of people have had really tough years financially. And when I was a kid, my mom was always involved with these charities that would provide presents for kids in need. So I started looking around my local area, trying to find something along those lines that, you know, wasn't being run by a church. But there's no local Toys for Tots distribution in my town. And there's only one charitable operation of any kind that isn't run by a church. So I pretty much went into that search knowing it was futile. So then I set about a task that turned out to be even more Sisyphean trying to find a church that I can trust with my fucking donation. Because look, how hard can this be? I just want to give you toys that you then wrap and hand to kids. Boom. End of transaction, right? Uh, Of the 13,600 churches in my town of 13,600 people, I figure there has to be one that could manage that without fucking it up and sprinkling indoctrination all over it, right? So I made a couple of calls and it was like, it was like a goddamn montage that Eli wrote is what it was fucking like. I mean, in the church's defense, the question I'm asking is, hey, is there any way you could give this present to a kid without being all religious about it? And and that's going to be awkward no matter how you sell it. And of course, I'm, I'm using the word atheist without even apologizing for my existence afterwards. So that's not helping matters. In all, I made it through four phone calls before I realized I needed to stop before I got arrested. So on two of the calls, the person I was talking to gave up on me and asked me to call back when a person with better bullshit was going to be there. One hung up on me, but I honestly couldn't tell if she was afraid of the word atheist or didn't know how these fancy phones without buttons worked. But but the fourth guy was such a spectacular asshole that he got his own fucking diatribe. So let me recreate the call for you as best I can. I call and I ask, you know, who should I talk to about the gift drive that they're advertising on their website? And like the other three calls, it just so happened that the person to talk to was whoever answered the fucking phone. 
right? Because when nobody actually does anything, there's no need to delegate, I guess. Anyway, so I explained my dilemma. I told him I, I, I'd rather give my donation to a secular charity, but I wasn't aware of anyone that served my local community. I told him I wanted to donate toys to kids with no toys, but I, I didn't want my donation used to advance a religious agenda. He did not understand, but that's okay. That's okay. I was expecting that. The people who think having to sell a cake to a gay person is persecution don't excel at seeing things from other people's points of view. So I came armed with an analogy. I said, so imagine like, you know, you're trying to donate food to a Muslim country that has no Christian charities operating. You know, you wouldn't want your money being used to advance their faith, but you still want to be able to feed people. Right. It's like that. And I figured that was rock solid. Right. I, I figured that when the stakes are charity for low income families, he wouldn't be intentionally obtuse. But I underestimated his Christianity, I guess. So the crux of his confusion was that Christmas was inherently Christian. So there's no possible way to give toys to kids on Jesus's birthday without promoting Christianity. So I, I explained that many secular Americans as well as Jewish, Muslim, and Hindu Americans exchange gifts on Christmas, so clearly there's some way to do that. And apparently them's fighting words where he comes from. Right? He started doing that thing that people do when they're they're in an argument, but you aren't yet, you know, like where they're taking little tiny breaths so you don't have time to interject in between their shit. And, and I'm still trying to salvage the conversation because my goal here is to donate toys to fucking kids. So so I try to back up a bit. I just offer up my basic question. I'm like, look, man, all I want to know is can parents get toys from your toy drive without being part of your congregation and without being proselytized to? And then I, I tried to add something along the lines of, and if that's not the case, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I just want to take my donation elsewhere. But I never got that far because he started literally yelling at me that I was dangerously misguided. And if I thought kids needed toys more than they needed the light of Christ's salvation, literally yelling at his phone about this shit. And I'm I'm way out of character right at this point. So I'm I'm just still trying to drag this guy back to civility. I'm like, look, man, I'm going to leave the religious upbringing to the kids parents. I just want him to have more presence. But this was not the right answer. Apparently, he starts indignantly sermonizing. And th at that point, I just hear potato, potato, potato. So I couldn't tell you what he's fucking talking about. I, I, I know I stayed on the line way after I kept telling myself I should hang up. I know at one point he tried to change my religion. At one point, he literally told me that atheists don't do charity forgetting apparently why the fuck I'd called him in the first place but all of that paled in comparison to my great sin which was to eventually use the term asshole right I, I didn't even call him an asshole my literal words were look man I'm not trying to be an asshole here but when I said asshole he had to be dragged over to his goddamn fainting couch so freshly incensed by my wanton vulgarity he launches into some victorious jeremiah ad about how my language confirms every bigoted thing that sprung to his mind when i said atheist in the first place and he condescendingly offers to send me a bible to help write my ways so i tell him look man i got a bible right next to me and it's probably a lot bigger than your bible so he gives me some passage or another to read and i say you know what man i'll read that just as soon as i can some of these pages are stuck together though i jerk off on this thing a lot and that's when he hung up on me. Now, there is a point to all of this beyond me just bitching about some asshole I had to endure on the phone. Because I, I have to admit that like for a full day afterwards, I kept returning to that weird vindication that he expressed about the use of the word asshole. So up until then, his tone seemed threatened. And afterwards, it was elated. And I know he had to cling to something to tell himself that he'd won the exchange or whatever, but it still seemed baffling the extent to which it changed. But then I put it into full context. Up until then, I was winning at being the good guy. I was doing Christ-like better than he was, or at least how he would define Christ-like. Right. The very fact that there was an atheist trying to do charity fucked up his whole goddamn worldview. And my repeated efforts to defuse the situation and not fight with them were just exacerbating his unease. I kept outdoing him in the being a good human department. The use of naughty words was the first thing I gave him that he could call a flaw under his warped definition of morality. So, in retrospect, as good as it might have felt, the line about splooging on a Bible actually gave him exactly the exculpation he was after. But you know what? I still can't make myself feel bad about it. After all, it's Christmas. I'm in a giving mood. Even knowing what I know now, I would happily offer to jack off on that pastor's Bible again anytime.
They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the Lou and Lou to my Lou, Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick. <laughs> Fellas, are you ready to do our favorite stuff? When I'm doing Lou, 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 I'm always picturing myself with an oversized lollipop. I think that's my favorite stuff. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, Heath, if you insert it slowly enough, they're just the right size lollipop. So. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> it sounds like we need to take a trip into Mr. Wizard's laboratory. So we're going to pause for a quick word from our first sponsor this week, Honey. Next. Well, hello there, little boy. <laughs> hey there, Santa. So I made a list of things I'd like, and I sure do hope you bring them to me. Then what do I look like, kid? Honey? Uh, you mean thick? Like with two C's? Because kind of. Yeah. I mean, that's not like my personal thing. No, but no, like, no, no, no. Not good, that kind of thick. It's a good Honey! Look. The one that automatically searches for promo codes online. They're helping pay for one million dollars worth of gifts this year. They are? They sure are. Just add Honey to your computer, create a free account, and throw some holiday gifts on your drop list for a chance to win. Honey will randomly select winners and give them the money to buy something on their list. No purchase necessary. You need a PayPal account to redeem the prize. Only valid in the U.S. Giveaway ends 12-21-2020. So what did you put on your list, Santa? <laughs> Why, milk and cookies, of course. Right, obviously. I put the new Amazon smart speaker on my drop list. CNN says it looks I didn't real- ask you, elf guy. I didn't ask you. Oh, Nobody okay. cares. Okay, <laughs> now that that's, that's not very nice. Thanks to Honey, I don't need to be nice. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash scathing. That's joinhoney.com slash scathing. Now, what were you saying about Santa being thick with two C's? Okay. Because Santa could put it down. It's okay. Put it yeah. down. Don't say it again. And now, back to the headlines. In our lead story tonight, Joe Biden got elected president of the United States. What? Again. Again? Like double <laughs> plus extra more president. Yep. Yeah. He won the election part. In November, that was crucial. Then he won a long series of court cases argued by almost crying attorneys and leaky attorneys who need a new <laughs> face gasket <laughs> and women banned from all TGI Fridays locations and also all Marriott hotels, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> she was fun. Yeah. Not so much a cracked legal team as it is a cracked legal team at this yeah, point. Or a legal <laughs> team on crack, in some sense. perhaps. Yeah, and then after that, Biden won some more when the Supreme Court ruled that Texas doesn't have to like it. And if <laughs> Texas wants something to cry about, they'll give him something to cry about. <laughs> and then Biden won again, again, again when the Electoral College certified its final vote this week. Yeah, no, he, he Trump basically made the news sites feel the need to put up the running count on the Electoral College vote, too. <laughs> so, like Somehow we got to watch an instant replay with bated breath. It was incredible. <laughs> All right, we got to hand count these electors now or something. <laughs> Some of them were in cardboard. So we finally have our answer. Joe Biden has been officially chosen by the God of the universe to lead the country forward into our bright future of... Gay communism. It's going to be great. Hell yeah. But that didn't stop a big group of heretical crinos, that's Christians in <laughs> yes, name uh-huh. only, from trying to undo the will of the Lord with a protest in Washington, D.C. using <laughs> the magical power of circle walking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The First technique. the courts, then the circle walking. Tune in next week for the official La 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 I Can't Hear You convention of <laughs> <Yeah>. 2020. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. to be fair, though, the, the, the circle walking has exactly the same chance of success as Ken Paxton's lawsuit. So. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so, these fake Christians showed up by the thousands. It, it, technically, you could express that in millions or billions, too. <laughs> and their big plan was to overturn the election by conducting a Jericho march, just like the Battle of Jericho from the Book of Joshua in the Old Testament. That is when a mob of Israelites surrounded a city because that city was full of Canaanites who were on God's list of races to exterminate that he really has. And then they did that. They did the extermination. 
They walked around in circles and blew some trumpets and the city walls fell down. And that's when they executed every single man, woman, and child and farm animal in Jericho, except for one prostitute who helped their spy team along the way. That's the story of Jericho. It is. That's the story. Mm -hmm. And the Christian right of 2020 is pretty sure they're the good guys right now. Just like the people in the Bible who had a musical parade of ethnic cleansing. You know, those good guys from the Bible. So the Trump squad did the same thing to honor that godly event. Well, and to be fair, they did it without masks during a plague. So they are definitely going to kill some women, children, and farm animals. Oh, yeah. No, right, right. (laughs) Historical accuracy. Yeah. Well, not as much the farm animals, but that's the thing. We'll get to it. They they missed a couple steps. So the Circle Walk event had a very prestigious group of speakers to go along with it in D.C. That includes anti-choice, god-awful movie maker Abby Johnson, Mm-hmm. conservative Christian commentator and R&B sensation Eric Metaxas. <laughs> pin in that for later. Yeah. Huge yeah. fucking pin in that for later. Oh, we Correct. can put all the pins you want into Eric Metaxas. <laughs> <laughs> also on the speaker list was convicted felon Michael Flynn. I believe he was the keynote. Mm-hmm. And of course, biblical soft rectangle engineer <laughs> the, the fucking my pillow guy i'm absolutely not looking up his name and following all that no doubt amazing oratory everyone walked around the u.s capitol seven times to stop joe biden from winning the election that he's won like eight times now wow Am I the only one that feels like this was all an elaborate, why were you with that prostitute last night excuse that had gone too far? (laughs) (laughs) So you're probably wondering, how did Joe Biden get certified by the Electoral College if these people did the Jericho magic? Jericho Mm -hmm. magic, yes. Thank you. Yeah, right. Great question. Well, unfortunately for the ethnic cleansing LARPers, (laughs) they didn't do their homework. First of all, they were supposed to walk around the target once a day for six yes. days and then walk around it seven times on the seventh day. Yep. Also, the spell doesn't work unless you're carrying the Ark of the Covenant the whole time when you're walking around. That's important. Just maybe read the book. Maybe read ahead <laughs> of the book. It's in the book. The answer's in the book. But most importantly, the Jericho thing absolutely never happened. And super motivated archaeologists have checked. Nothing like that. <laughs> Mm-mm. But even if they did get the Ark and the timing right... We all know it wouldn't be possible for Trump supporters to be nice to a prostitute. So the whole point is, you know, it's it's all moot. (laughs) And in white to believe news. A phenomenal call sideways. Thank you. Thank you. The town of Murdoch, Minnesota voted to allow an officially whites only church to open up in their town this week because of everything we've been telling you on this show Forever. For the whole I, show. I, I I know there's so many questions, but how is this a municipal vote? Good question. <laughs> Good, Good, question. Good question. So guarantee it involved gerrymandering somehow. <laughs> Seems like it would have to. Yeah. So here's the story. The church in question is called the Asatru Folk Assembly. And according to their website, quote, Asatru is about roots, ellipses. It's about connections, ellipses. It's about coming home. Okay. First of all, I believe it's Asatru, but it's also so far sounding like you're trying to talk me into trying ayahuasca or something. <laughs> well, they'll fit right in when they get interviewed by Joe Rogan. So that'll be well, that, <laughs> they will. Right. So in their nonsensical declaration of purpose, item two is the preservation of ethnic European folk and their continued evolution, where they clarify, quote, let us be clear by ethnic European folk. We mean white people. <laughs> and, well, who said Slavic? Get the fuck out. This is serious. <laughs> that's that's definitely that was a huge argument when they had. Oh, they were like, sure. no, We meant we need to clarify. We mean white people, and not even Mediterraneans. Like, just not even Somebody get out the paint chips. Let's yeah. be clear about this. Yes. They also added in their statement of ethics, "quote We in Asatru support strong, healthy." white family relationships. What? We want our children to grow up to be mothers and fathers to white children of their own. End quote. Woof. Not adding dot, dot, dot siblings, their own siblings. <laughs> but I, I feel like it was implied. Yeah. 
One last thing about these assholes, I just have to mention, their symbol is very clearly a swastika, but a fat swastika. Huh. Yeah. But to be fair, if you did need a symbol for a whites only church setting up in Minnesota, a fat swastika does kind of fucking nail it, right? Yeah, no, <laughs> it does. Chubby swastika. So yeah. You put a put a scarf on it and yeah, you nailed it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So this charming group of folks decided last year that they wanted to set up their Midwest Regional Center in Murdoch, at which point all the same people in town were like, really? We're already called Murdoch, Minnesota. Couldn't we host a fucking sister fucking convention or something instead? Uh, but no, sadly, Heath insisted that SisterCon 2020 take place in Cincinnati okay. this year. It's not. So last We're week, the town council so voted much. three to one to allow the bigots to set up their church. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, OK, Eli, that's shitty. But what does that have to do with the Supreme Court? Well, according to the town, literally everything. After the vote, an attorney for the city basically said, yeah, we're doing this not to get sued. Quote, yeah, there are certain constitutional protections that apply to religions. I haven't seen any evidence sufficient to overcome the presumption that they are a religion, whether you agree or not, end quote. And the scary part is, according to our current Supreme Court over the last few years, he's absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, no, especially this iteration we got today. Look, I mean, the, the upside is that by letting them do this, we might avoid Supreme Court precedent that explicitly protects it. Yeah. That's actually good news. Wow, that's scary. Right? Mm hmm Yeah. So quick reminder of this story. Next time someone tells you that religious freedom is all about live and let live, it's uh, not a slippery slope if you're passing all your examples on the way down. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and in all lives martyr news. Fantastic. Well done. We have a story about a Christian activist group called Voice of the Martyrs. And they might get us all killed. <laughs> so you're doing it backwards, guys. <laughs> so, all right, let's start at the beginning. Let's start with a very basic axiom of life. Don't attach Bibles to balloons and fly them around. Yep. I mean, that's just like a good kindergarten lesson. Sure. It's a stupid thing to be doing. Like, best case scenario is nothing. Yeah, no The good. ideal outcome of that is nothing happens. <laughs> <laughs> right. But the... Hell evangelists over at Voice of the Martyrs <laughs> wanted to know what the worst case scenario would be. And it looks like they found the perfect answer to that question. They created balloon powered Bible drones for distributing the word of God. And then they sent these unidentified flying objects into North Korean airspace oh, without Jesus authorization. Oh, Jesus fucking Christ. Oh, I got to tell you, Heath, I was listening to that whole opening thing being like, okay, that's stupid, but how does it get us killed? Right, there it is. That's stupid, but how does that get us killed? Oh, that's how it gets <laughs> us <Yeah>. killed. <laughs> Nailed it. <sighs> okay, so here's a quick background on Voice of the Martyrs. Their website is persecution.com. <laughs> and that tells you pretty much the whole story. Yep. They park on perfectly good porn domains and they try to provide aid for people around the world being persecuted for their religion. But they only help the Christian victims of persecution because they're bigots. Well, yeah, I mean, they, they only help Christians, but they don't only help Christians. So. <laughs> Christian music bonfire. And their mission statement is oddly self-aware, maybe by accident. It says... We're dedicated to serving our persecuted family worldwide through practical and spiritual assistance. <laughs> yeah. We do the spiritual stuff when it seems like someone might get shooty or stabby. You well, know? <laughs> yeah, right. In other words, we're happy to take your donations whether or not we do anything with them. Yeah, they are. Sadly, it's the practical part of the assistance that's the biggest problem right now. If Voice of the Martyrs was just bilking people out of their money to pay for thoughts and prayers to be sent across the globe, that would be so much fucking better than what they're doing right now. Instead, they're actually going to South Korea, sending makeshift aircraft across the border into North Korea and dropping highly illegal contraband into the backyards of North Korean people. If you get caught with a Bible in North Korea, 
you can literally be executed as a punishment. Wow. Just a bunch of North Koreans running from the Bible drones, like the scene from North by Northwest. <laughs> <laughs> or depending on how their fundraising is going, like the scene in the birds. You know? Yeah, it could be a lot of balloons. <laughs> so this might be the dumbest thing that's ever happened. Like ever, ever, ever. And we do multiple shows exploring that exact topic. Yeah, yeah we had a story about a fucking coconut that got arrested once. Yeah, That's our <laughs> whole thing. This still might be the dumbest of all the things. So first of all, if you tell the North Korean state police, it's not my fault. The Samiz dot contraband fell out of the sky into my <laughs> yard. That's why I have it. It's not going to go very well. Mm -mm. Okay, actually, you know what? First of all, the real first of all, the Bible is stupid and evil. Yeah, Second, okay, yeah, exactly. The possible execution thing. But most importantly, don't send surprise flying stuff at the insane nuclear despot shaped like a literal snowman. That's a bad <laughs> idea. Even if your balloon technology is better than his rocket technology, still a bad <laughs> idea. He probably, probably gets mad about that. Okay. See, now I'm picturing Kim Jong-un trying to float a nuke over to South Korean border like Charlie <laughs> Brown flying a kite. Well, of course. <laughs> we're, all, we're all thinking. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> Nuclear Holocaust. And in Lies of Locke the Moron news. What? Huh? Lies of Locke the Moron. It's a f fantasy novel. But you know, I don't, I don't thank you enough for keeping like our show so relevant and topical, Eli. I think. Thank you. You're welcome. Nail it. Noah. I'll admit it, things can get a little glum here at The Scathing Atheist. Reporting on the increasing power of tax-free, legally protected plague spreaders week after week can get you down. But like pretzel day on The Office, once in a while, we get a real treat. Namely, when the mainstream media finds out about and accidentally interviews one of our crazy assholes. Oh, I love those days. <laughs> yeah. And this week, the crazy asshole in question was COVID-denying pastor and plague of Dunkin' Donuts worldwide, Greg Locke. <laughs> okay, well, to be fair, he's, he's a plague of all businesses now. Yeah, he's locked it in. He's so stupid. It's amazing. <laughs> all right. So while being interviewed about his COVID-flaunting church services, Pastor Locke doubled down on the idea that COVID-19 is not a pandemic, much to CNN's L. Reeves' mystification. So, without further ado, we here at The Scathing Atheist would like to present you with that word-for-word -word interaction right now with commentary from our very own Heath Enright. Okay. Noah, will you be my Pastor Locke? Oh, always. <clears throat> I'm saying the sickness is real. I'm saying the pandemic is not. I don't understand what you mean when you say pandemic's not real. Don't just repeat what you said again, Greg The Locke. pandemic don't. is not real. Fuck your face. But what do you think a pandemic is? Not COVID-19. But what do you think a pandemic is? Maybe say it like a, like an old-timey ghost detective when you say it again. It is no pandemic. There it is. This is where no. Locke's publicist says from off screen, I think we've stuck on the pandemic question too many times. <laughs> yeah, words are tricky. Words are tricky. So Reeves follows up. Well, why can't you answer it? It's ridiculous. I did. There's no pandemic. COVID-19 is not a pandemic. But what is a pandemic then? <laughs> not what we're experiencing. Don't say your age right now. I'm though. 44 no years old. Your, yep, We've not is. won in my lifetime, so I don't know. And this is not it. Fuck your face. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck your 44-year-old face. I don't know. Oh, I'm so angry I that I know, know that I know what it is. That's now. how I know that it's not this. All right. Well, I just pretended to be Greg Locke, so I need a break to clean myself. We're going to pause for a quick word from our second sponsor this week, Keeps. All right. Heath, Eli, you guys ready to open your presents for me? Sure am. Let's do oh, it. Oh, firing power over Heath? What? No. Fine. Oh, look, it's uh it it it's hair. Mm -hmm. You got you got Heath and I a box of hair for Christmas? You got us hair? Yeah. Yeah, I, I know you guys are thinning a bit up top, so I figured, hey, who has the most luscious locks and, and, and could make a donation? This guy with these two thumbs right here. I mean I, I appreciate it, Noah, but um, um I, I do not, just well, for the record. Heath and I already have keeps. Got you a very fancy toilet seat bidet washlet. What's uh what's keeps? It was expensive. I got you the nicest one. I did a lot of research. Keeps it said it was like the best. Offers generic versions of the only two FDA approved hair loss products out there. You may have tried them before, but never for this price. 
So wait, you can get hair loss medication online and for a good price? Ordered it online. That's where I got these Keeps photo things. Treatment online. starts at just $10 a month. Plus, for a limited time, you can get your first month for free. They make it easy and deliver your medication every three months, so you can say goodbye to pharmacy checkout lines and awkward doctor's visits. Wow, that does sound good. Paid for the express shipping, so it got there nice and early for you. So, so if you're really ready to take gift. action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash scathing to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash scathing. Oh, well, now my gift seems kind of pointless. Aw, Noah, it's not pointless. Look how much it upset Heath. Oh, well, that's true. Getting you guys socks next year. <laughs> like, not good ones. Like scratchy socks. <laughs> a man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she wants. If it's a legitimate rape. It makes you a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Massachusetts. Yeah, I know. I miss you guys, too. And apparently I've been going so long that these assholes think they're going to get away with it all of a sudden. So let's start with professional bigot and some of the GOP's best friends, Jesse Lee Peterson, who wasn't able to join his fellow conservatives in celebrating the elevation of Amy Covid Barrett to the nation's highest court. Well, I'm sure he's thrilled to have somebody on board that can join in his disdain for female bodily autonomy. This was overshadowed by the disgust he felt at women having man jobs. Quote, this woman thinks that she's above men and that she is a man and that she can go to work and raise children and be like a man. That is not true, end quote. And while I do agree that that's not true, that doesn't excuse him for saying it. And apparently when he saw that wasn't enough misogyny to coax me back onto the podcast, he also took to the airwaves to lament all, all Republican women that were elected to the House of Representatives. Quote, they have weakened the party by putting all of these women in charge. The strength is not in the women, it's in the men. End quote. A statement that would be a lot easier to take seriously in a week that Republican men didn't spend hiding from the term doctor as it applies to women. But Jesse Lee wasn't the only one taking advantage of my absence. My arch nemesis, Lori Alexander, has also been saying words again. Her latest tirade against the evils of her own human rights came in response to a New Yorker cover that you probably saw. It's the one that shows a chick on a Zoom meeting where she's wearing a really nice blouse and has her hair and makeup all done up, but she's wearing gym shorts and flip-flops, and everywhere the camera isn't pointed is a mess of discarded bottles, cats, and discarded masks and gloves. And this humorous illustration of how our lives were transformed in 2020 pissed Lori off because that pan-racial bitch on the cover didn't have no babies on her teats. Quote, Many women no longer are good housekeepers. Instead of nurturing babies, they are nurturing cats. They find their escape through alcohol. Blah, blah, blah. Feminism is Marxist. Blah, blah, blah. And then she concludes, quote, with a cluttered home, only cats to cuddle with, and a cold screen to stare at with a drink in their hands, they are finding that their lives are more empty and meaningless rather than fulfilling. End quote. Now, Keep in mind that this is the same piece of shit that celebrated the plague that's killing thousands of people a day because it was forcing some working mothers to stay home with their kids now that they were laid off and uncertain how they would provide for their families. And look, Lori, you pissed me off plenty before. Hell, you achieved arch nemesis status years ago, and I bet your pampered ass thought I was going hard on you before. But now you've come after cat mommies, and I can't have that. You can have my freedom, but you'll never take my chonkers. The gloves are coming off, Lori, and I mean that metaphorically. There's no way I'd get within 20 fucking feet of you without proper PPE. And on that note, and with another promise not to make it so long in between visits, I'll hand things back over to Noah, Heath, and Eli. Thank you, Lucinda. Next up in headlines in the the right's the right, left the left news tonight. <laughs> here's hoping you got plenty of mileage out of all that religious freedom you had earlier this month, because if you're an atheist in America... You're about to have less of it. Yep. And that's thanks to yet another Trump administration rule change that tells the non-religious to lame duck themselves. The new rules loosen restrictions that kept religious groups that receive taxpayer money for secular services from forcing their religious views on people while so doing. So in other words, those secular services no longer need to be secular. Right. But 
they still have to keep that taxpayer money in a separate pile of money until they use it, right? So yeah, well, uh, yeah, right, secular exactly. Secular no. America. Yeah, this this new change affects nine federal agencies and does away with a series of regulations meant to keep taxpayer money from directly funding religious proselytization. So, like in the past. The rule said that a religious group providing services had to refer clients elsewhere if they said they were uncomfortable with the religious affiliation of that group. In the past, the rules required those groups to tell people receiving services that they didn't have to participate in religious activities to get them. In the past, the sole provider for secular services in an area couldn't be religious. This new change would eliminate all of those protections. OK, I mean, good, like libertarian. It's about time we got rid of all the red tape around this is charity and this is bribery. Like, whatever. <laughs> this, this is America. Use the words I want. Okay, so we're starting a bunch of Satanist charities with mandatory milk ceremonies at the beginning, right? Just to uh, get this nipped in the bud real quick. Yeah, right, yeah. Now, as egregious as this is, the true villainy of it can only really be appreciated when you contextualize it with the lead story from last week, which allowed all federal contractors a right to discriminate as long as they did so religiously. And as blatantly illegal as that sounds, it's pretty much already got the SCOTUS seal of approval. This means that the ultimate decision of who has access to taxpayer funded services is going to wind up in the hands of churches and religious groups all over the country. LGBTQ people, for example, will be forced to pay churches to discriminate against them M more in a new. I guess yeah, yeah. I guess more than they're already like they're, they're already doing that, but more so. Yeah, great. So religion can eat its cake and have it too, and refuse to sell it to same-sex couples. Yep. Great. And miscegenated couples and Jewish people. Uh, Fantastic. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And, and then when those gay Jewish miscegenated couples are starving for cake, the charity that those same people run can make them sit through a prayer about how terrible they are before they get any of the cake they're starving yep. for because they didn't get the whole thing. If they decide to give them some. Yep. Yeah. And and much like the rule change that we discussed last week, it's important to remember that these changes cannot be undone immediately. I mean, the Biden administration is definitely going to change these rules back as soon as they can. But there are required public comment periods and, and hurdles that have to be overcome along the way. There are studies that you have to do, et cetera, et cetera. So this will take place and it will be in effect long enough to gravely affect some people's lives. Also, the Biden administration is going to have so much egregious shit to undo that who the fuck knows where this winds up under the uh, egregious shit triage, mm -hmm. right? So look forward to plenty of depressing Trump era stories on this show well into the Biden administration. <laughs> we have an egregious shit triage industry that we have to have now. Yep. yep. That's been created. An egregious shit triage administration. <laughs> yeah, fuck. exactly. Yeah. Okay, well, next up in headlines, I got a fun one for you. You do have a fun one for us. Yeah, I forgot yeah. about this. Mm, this is fun. Eric Metaxas, the R&B sensation <laughs> that we were talking about earlier. Remember the pin? He made a song, and it is aggressively bad. Yeah, it it's so fucking bad. It's a remake of Mary Did You Know by Pentatonix. And for those who aren't familiar, Pentatonix is... An acapella band. So not a great start. <laughs> Eric Metaxas needs to have so many more than zero instruments playing while his voice is happening. <laughs> yes. Especially when his version is called Biden, did you know? And it's about how the Democrats <laughs> stole the election. Mm, a word of advice, Eric. Don't tempt people to take you on in song when you're a perpetually swollen human whose name rhymes with anaphylaxis, all right? <laughs> he doesn't know that word. Okay, but now, based on how we now know that he sings, I am prepared to believe that when he sucker punched that guy, he was, in fact, just trying to dance with him. So, <laughs> <laughs> there's the twist. <laughs> so, this thing is both horrible and delightful at the oh, same time. Oh, yes. Like, musically... <laughs> It's the longest three minutes of my life, but <laughs> emotionally, it's fucking fantastic because I got to watch Eric Metaxas descend into madness musically, musically. from Eric Metaxas, like from it's where amazing. he starts. <laughs> he's just naming random conspiracy stuff he heard and trying to vaguely smoosh it into a piece of music that he clearly doesn't know well enough mm, to smoosh yes. into. And <laughs> The energy of the video he made never lines up with 
the meaning of the lyrics that he's trying to sing. Like he starts out, he's all pumped up. He's getting his face right up in the camera. Like, you know, that bass player, nobody can name who gets five seconds in a music yeah. video <laughs> one time and he's doing weird angles and faces and he's getting right on the camera. He's doing that. But then he realizes he's almost weeping because he's actually singing a lament to Joe Biden. That's the song. <laughs> yeah. It's like he's Eponine doing it on my own, but he's doing the bass player thing. It's crazy. But just in case you start to empathize with any of Eric Metaxas's deep sadness, <laughs> every so often in the video, they show you a cardboard cutout, a life-size cardboard cutout of the My Pillow guy yep. in his house. Eric Metaxas clearly owns that and displays it prominently in his house. <laughs> well, worse yet, that's the video's sponsor. The My Pillow guy is holding up a pillow on which is written a promo code. It's a promo mm -hmm. code. This whole thing is literally a My Pillow commercial. <laughs> it is. It really is, though. Okay, but guys, the long tail marketing crossover is insane on that video, right? Like if he had cut open the pillow and inside was a bunch of ultra brain pills, 100% <laughs> customer retention. Yeah. So full disclosure, I just, I can't stop watching it. I could, I, I watched it so many times. I went through it maybe 10 times yesterday <laughs> and it's been stuck in my head ever since. I think my favorite part is watching Eric Metaxas slowly realize on camera that you can't just, create a good piece of music because you feel like it, even if you pretty much completely steal it from real musicians. But he keeps trying new stuff that doesn't work. Like he's dancing for a second and then he immediately has to stop. He has to <laughs> give up on dancing on camera. He, he does a recitative for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's, he does. It's, it's fucking amazing. <laughs> It, it plays like there's somebody off camera who has to like repeatedly hold up a sign that says sing, don't talk. It's it's, it's what happens when there just is no shame anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously. If you are an artist who is like going through a block right now, you need this video in your life. You will finish your novel by midnight tonight. Just making up words like Shakespeare. No backspace is used. He is a creative laxative. Absolutely. <laughs> and I hate to end this on a sad note, but I just tried to watch it again earlier today. And apparently it got taken down for, well, directly lifting huge chunks of the Pentatonix music video, mm -hmm. which is probably for the best now that I think about it. I mean, I like acapella music way more than the appropriate amount. But here's the thing. If I wanted to watch Eric Metaxas doing acapella, trying to get a hand job from a college kid in a North Face jacket and New Balance sneakers. I'd go to Liberty University. <laughs> Good chance I'd even see the My Pillow guy in the background. Oh, yeah, yeah actually. Exactly. <laughs> Does this hand job have a promo code? <laughs> <laughs> Can we prorate it? And in fuck hole your seatbelts news. Nice. Right wing radio host and COVID proof pastor who totally got COVID, E.W. Jackson took to his show this week to explain how planes work. And surprise, surprise, it is not however planes work. <laughs> yeah, lift. I actually... <laughs> Anyways, it turns out that planes stay in the air because of Christian prayers. Yeah, why, huh. why else would it be wing and uh, damn it? <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. I knew we prayed down those planes over Pennsylvania. 9-11 <laughs> was a magical duel with Islam and we lost. I yeah. fucking knew it. Ooh. Yeah, so after begrudgingly admitting that he's grateful for the scientific breakthroughs like medicine or aeronautics, he says, quote, but, but they, he means people who build airplanes, still only know a little about a little. And God knows everything about everything. Well, there you and go. And when I get on that plane, you know what I'm saying? What are you saying? Lord, touch the pilot. Lord, guide mm, their hands. They don't like that. Lord, give them judgment. Lord, give them wisdom. If there is any kind of emergency, help them to know what to do in the situation. Surround this plane with your angels. <laughs> Every time one of his planes lands, he looks around at the other passengers. You're welcome. <laughs> angels. Great work, everybody. 
Okay, now everybody pray for uh, everyone to stand up at the exact same time for no reason and <laughs> smash into the aisle. Even the people sitting on the inside when I'm on the outside. Yeah, what the... Do you need to get up? Do you need to get up? Where are you going to go? <laughs> where, where are you going to go right there? We're gonna, are we gonna, I'm sorry, are we going to take turns getting off the plane like every other plane ever? Okay. Do you need to get oh. next to this very sweaty man who's pressed up against me? <laughs> My name is Eli. <laughs> He continues, quote, you have some idiot getting on the plane. I don't believe in God. I believe in science. These scientists know what to do. These pilots know what to That's do. That's what I always say when I get on a plane. <laughs> I'm totally doing this exact monologue next time I get on a plane. Wait, what's the rest of it? <laughs> these, these aeronautical engineers know what to do. I trust in them. What do we really need to talk about God for? We don't need God. Look at what we did. That's the fool. <laughs> ma'am, ma'am, do you have a minute to talk about aeronautical engineers? Let's get into this. <laughs> that if something goes wrong on that airplane, his life is saved because a believer was on that airplane praying and saying, Lord, I am under your protection. And somehow, miraculously, everybody gets out alive and some idiot has the nerve to say, isn't what we can do with science amazing? <laughs> okay, wait, wait, all right, okay. E.W. Jackson, you said Christians don't get COVID, you got COVID. <laughs> the very next <laughs> thing that you say is Christians can't <laughs> die in fiery plane crashes? <laughs> Have you learned nothing, man? Say oh. more stuff. Say stuff. <laughs> they can't have them. Yeah. Noah, you are a to step you. ahead of me because this is a very testable claim. <laughs> what about cobras? <laughs> what about snakes on a fucking plane, man? Tell us about that. Yeah. So, EW, if you're listening, and we know you are because I cleverly disguised this podcast on Twitter as a gay OnlyFans account, and we know how much you love those, <laughs> I accept your challenge. We will fly on a plane powered by science, and you will fly on a plane powered by prayer. First one to not die wins. Go. <laughs> Go. We are, we are well, racing. He's not going to die. He's, he's going to sit there on the top. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I'll say we'll, we'll be the ones that wind up in the air. We'll be in way more danger. We'll be at risk. All right. And finally tonight, in Thief in the Night news, former congresswoman and creepy painting with eyes that follow you around, Michelle Bachman was at a political rally in Georgia last Friday trying to rally the Republican vote ahead of the uh, uh, January Senate runoff. And her message to rally goers can best be summed up as votes are routinely stolen. Your participation may or may not count. None of it really matters. <laughs> That's true. Yep. Republicans of Georgia. Yeah. yeah. And, and if you think that she was accusing Democrats of stealing the votes, by the way, I think you've momentarily forgotten how fucking crazy Michelle Bachman is because she cut out the middleman and pinned the vote stealing directly on Satan. On Satan? Yep. Really? Yep. The magical demon stole just enough votes to get a runoff, <laughs> but not win for the team that Satan won? That would like cover his tracks because mm -hmm. it, would be, it would be like... Double? Oh, well, excuse Satan for having a sense of drama. He said, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. He was building a moment dramatically. Yeah, exactly. Is that yeah, right? Right, right. Okay. That's right. The great horned one has thrown his weight around the American political arena once again. And Bachman assures us that we've already seen the fruits of his labor. After all, on election night, we all collectively witnessed, quote, Satan snatching away from America rule by the consent of the governed, adding, quote, Satan was stealing from us our right to vote. I am highly offended, insulted, angry, and I'm not going to stand for the fact that my vote was stolen, end quote. OK, if David Perdue and Kelly Leffler aren't good enough for Satan, that's not <laughs> our fault. <laughs> better candidates, man. <laughs> If the GOP can't beat a black guy and a Jewish guy in fucking Georgia, they deserve to be tormented by a demon forever. <laughs> right. I mean, to be fair, they deserve to be tormented by a demon forever for other reasons, well, no, too. No, that's true. We already yeah, had yeah, that point extra now. But yeah, as terrifying as it is to have so many prominent Republicans fanning the flames of this fascist fraud fantasy, it comes with the silver lining that outshines the rest of the goddamn cloud. Because all over the state of Georgia, Democrats are talking about John Ossoff, Raphael Warnock, and control of the goddamn Senate. And Republicans are talking about Donald Trump, Satan, and how fraudulent elections in the U.S. are. 
And it kind of leaves me feeling warm and fuzzy inside because I really didn't think Michelle was going to get me anything this year. <laughs> so so I, I, mean, I guess I got to jump on Amazon and find out if I normalizer is a thing. So we're going to close the headlines there. He, Eli, thanks as always. Joel Osteen tooth surfboard. <laughs> when we come back, we'll learn that toe tapping sometimes means that you're just impatient for the fucking song to end. Hey, podcast listener, as you might already know, we raised a fuck ton of money to help win back the Senate last month on the Cognitive Dissonance Save the Senate live stream. But more importantly, we beat Andrew and Thomas. We beat Andrew and Thomas. Exactly. Yes, yes we did. We did. But many of you reached out either because you didn't have a chance to give or because you didn't want to choose between us. Foolish. You chose us, obviously. Obviously. Yes, yeah, that's, that's correct. Chose. Well, luckily, this Sunday, December 20th, you don't have to choose because Thomas and Andrew are hosting their very own live stream to save the Senate from 4 to 7 p.m. Eastern with a whole new slate of guests who you can feel much better about crushing with your generosity. Oh, no, Ross and Carrie. More like, oh, no, we raised way less money than the puzzle in a thunderstorm audience. Okay. That's yeah. Rough. Now, our segment is from 6.30 to 7 p.m., and we'd love to finish strong. So whether you didn't get a chance to donate last time, you've got a little extra cash to give, or you just want to do some good while your favorite shows are still on the team, head over to the Opening Arguments YouTube channel and give during our segment. Again, that's 6.30 p.m. Eastern this Sunday, December 20th. Because after all, the only thing we want to crush more than Andrew and Thomas is Mitch McConnell. Mm, yeah, no, that's fair. That is fair. Over on our sister show, God Awful Movies, we break down the very worst that Christian cinema has to offer, but movies are far from the only thing that Christians are terrible at. They suck at short films, books, comics, stand-up comedy, TV shows, music. Hell, if there was a thing called Christian blinking, it would somehow suck, which is why we occasionally <laughs> borrow that show's format for a segment that we call God Awful Music. So tell us, Heath, what will we be breaking down today? We listened to Christmas is for Children, the song, but not the 1968 version by Glenn Campbell. Different nope. song. We listened <laughs> to some random song that Eli fixated on from a Gam movie <laughs> that not even Google knows about. Nope, so nope. I, yeah. I haven't even heard this song because I couldn't even <laughs> physically find it. I don't know. I, I have no idea. I've seen the lyrics now. Eli, put them, okay. put them in a thing. So for clarity... This little ditty comes from the opening credits to Chip Rossetti's The Borrowed Christmas, which we just reviewed over on our sister show, God Awful Movies. It's free on Prime if you want to listen. But more importantly, I've thought about this song every day since that review, and I need to finally give it its due. <laughs> All right. Okay. Really? So, Eli, how bad was this music? Well, if you love listening to the You're My Cuppy Cake song while you admire your lady bending over lawn ornaments and drinking <laughs> caramel straight from a jar. Interesting. You will love you've, your song. You've painted me a picture, Eli. You've painted me a picture. If, if eating an entire ice cream cake in one sitting could be music, it would be this song. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I reject that analogy because that just means that this song is too much of a good thing. But okay. So, <laughs> yeah. so we're going to start off in, in this song, like any good essay would, stating the premise. So <clears throat> the song starts, Christmas is defined by the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> so Christmas is for children who believe in Santa Claus. And we made it two lines before the Jews can fuck themselves. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep. But we only made it one line before the Catholics found somebody they could fuck. All right, so, so the lyrics continue as though Chris Kringle had a gun to the songwriter's head <laughs> and snowflakes on the window panes, stockings filled with candy canes, and puppies showing just their nose and paws. What? Really gruesome if you picture it. Well, well. Yeah, so the, I'm sure it was that line that Eli was obsessing over, and that's the reason that we're doing because <laughs> that, that sounds like a trying to escape pose to me, <laughs> right? It does. Okay, so just to review, it's Christmas, no Jewish people allowed, and there's a puppy in a pillory just <laughs> locked in. Yep. That's a weird exactly. start. Okay, yes. the stage is set for a Christmas song. Go. <laughs> All right. Well, so that's four whole lines now with different lyrics in each one. So the song has to kind of repeat itself a little bit here. Next lyric goes, 
Christmas is for children who can't wait to trim the tree and paper chains and shiny lights and jingle bells and silent nights. Really? Plural? Um, like they can't wait to silent nights? Yeah. What they the can't wait to paper chains? <laughs> what are we even trying to say, motherfuckers? <laughs> Sure hope Santa brings me a verb tomorrow. <laughs> right. And and special times with friends and family. Christmas is for children like me. That's now you see why I said family like that. Yeah. Because of the stupid <laughs> rhymes in this fucking song. <laughs> Sung by the way by a full grown woman. Right. So yes, a Christmas is for children like me. Mm. Full grown woman who believes in Santa Claus, if we're believing <laughs> the first line here. <laughs> And in the music video for this, I'm pretty sure this is where she's online for a mall Santa and gets into a violent altercation with a child about back cuts and what's allowed, <laughs> that sort of thing. I mean, I'm pretty sure that was you. He it was me. That was me. It didn't have to be violent. The, that kid chose I was being cool for it. The kid <laughs> escalated and then I escalated. Well, yeah. And it was to, he started. You know, look like a punk. He was very large. <laughs> All right, so the song continues blurting out words like Mrs. Claus having a stroke. Silver bells and new white snow. Put your finger on the ribbon while I tie the bow. Okay. Yeah, because dribble your eggnog all over my tits didn't rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not like the lack of rhyme has stopped them before. <laughs> eggnog, yule log. There's something there. Yep. Oh, speaking of which, this is so fucking bad here. Kisses neath the mistletoe and love, that's understood. Why yeah. is that understood? Seems cocky. Yeah. Yeah, just that whole thing. It's probably time for Christianity to lose the shrub of consent thing <laughs> from Christmas. Yeah. I don't think that's a good idea. All right, but no, but that was setting up this brilliant fucking rhyme. And don't those roasting chestnuts smell good? I did, but God, that rhyme was so strange. They're going to need an official timeout to cart it off the fucking field. <laughs> <laughs> that rhyme's going to go home and kill its whole family. Oh, God. Absolutely. Jesus Christ, dude. Should have let that rhyme be gay. <laughs> let that rhyme be gay. <laughs> and, okay, so at this point, the song feels that it's lulled you in with all its QC shit, like silver bells and puppy stockades. So now it's time to layer in the religious propaganda. Christmas is for children who rejoice on Christmas Eve, for Christ was born this holy night nope. beneath the stars of wondrous light, a wondrous gift for all who dare believe. Yes, for all who dare to succumb to the will of the majority and travel the path of least <laughs> resistance. <laughs> also, wonders and wondrous, three words apart, two thumbs yeah. down. Two thumbs no down. rhyme being used. After you all. You're my one, one <laughs> oasis thing. But oh wait, there's more. Ooh, but most of all, this time of year, I crave that peace on earth is near. I'm like, fuck your bullshit Miss America answer and just tell me what you want for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, so we finish off. So all these Christmas joys will always be for Christmas is for children like me. <laughs> so... With that reminder that no matter how much you hate Wham, it actually could be worse. We're going to wrap up for the night, but we'll be back soon with even more god-awful music. Before we close the book for the night, I wanted to urge you one more time to hop onto Andrew and Thomas's live stream on Sunday. That's the 20th at 6.30 p.m. and help take back the Senate. The campaigns have literally reached out to us this time and asked for our help. So if you didn't get a chance to donate last time, this is your opportunity. And if the future of America isn't enough to motivate you, keep in mind there's an off chance that if this goes really well, Eli might wind up in the same room as a senator, a pastor one at that. Anyway, that's all the blast we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show, The Skeptocrat, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern time on Monday. An even newer episode of our sister show's hot friend, God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday. And an even newer episode of our half sister show, Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I'd suck eggs if I neglected to thank the lovely and talented Heath Enright for all the loveliness and the talent. I need to thank the lovely and talented Eli Bosnick for all the talent and the loveliness. I need to thank the lovely and talented Lucinda Delusions for being so generous with her signature descriptors. I also want to thank John for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. Especially love the part where you told us you weren't a podcaster while you were apparently dropping change on your microphone. 
great meta joke, intentional or otherwise, dude. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's best people, Jennifer, Paul, Heidi, Robert, Daniel, and Johan. Jennifer, Paul, and Heidi, whose IQs are so high, China and Nepal can't agree on an exact number, and Robert, Daniel, and Johan, who gives Santa a sack full of goodies envy. Together, these six savory seculars set about securing sustained scatological spasms from satire this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the money it takes to give us money, but if you do, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help but you spend all your money on those ungrateful kids again, you can also help a ton by leaving us a five-star review, telling a friend about the show, and following us at PIATPod on Twitter. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robinson handles our social media. Our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. He's colorblind, but with punctuation. And what I was going to say, and commas are all <laughs> dark brown and yellow. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved.